it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Hansmeyer here back in Tokyo. Uh, he's a regular visitor to Tokyo at this time. Uh, he was here uh, two years ago, uh, gave a lecture here as a part of digital fabrication and launch party, or launch event, I should say. And also he was here at the uh, Rode uh, Symposium. That was also two years ago. Uh, since then, he has visited a couple of times. Uh, just a quick uh, background of Michael's uh, work and also CV. Uh, he's currently a director of advanced uh, design studies at the ATH, and this is also part of our <coughs> uh, ATH has actually very uh, advanced uh, CAAD, that stands for AA Architectural Design, uh, and he's part of that uh, computational uh, research and also design at the ATH. But just to give you a quick uh, intro of his work that we're going to be looking at, uh, I'm looking at the title here, Digital Grotesque, uh, he just called it trying to kind of move away from the rationality of gen uh, generating the design of the forms, but my assumption that it's going to be more kind of experimental, experimental, as well as experiential as the national architecture of the fields. Uh, but interesting thing about his work, uh, back in 1990s, uh, when architectural forms begin to explore Instead of platonic uh, given geometry, square, circle, triangle, into uh, this the concept of morphology, study of geometry becomes a major topic of architectural uh, computational design, particularly the concept of digital technology. Uh, but there are two camps on um, studying geometry one is called morphodynamic and morphogenitive. And that is, the geometry can be organized through external forces, and that will generate the geometry. And the other one is the generative system, or for a generative process. That's what the Michael is really good at, which is the forms are not necessarily defined by external forces, but has its own internal logic. A manipulation of logic, like the DNA, has an ability to produce a multiple possible organization as well as kind of formal quality. So he's been a leading figure of that part of the generative system of geometry. And he has given a number of lectures for that and namely in places like TED where he has given a lecture in the International Economics. So uh, with that, please uh, join me welcoming uh, Michael Parsons. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to be here. Um, I'd like to show two projects today only um, that I think have become really possible only in the past couple of years to, to design and produce. The first one deals primarily with using computation as a, as a design tool. And the second one is, deals primarily with digital fabrication. Um, let me begin by a question I think that we all ask ourselves, what, what is the origin um, of form? Um, I, there, I had a design, studying at Columbia, and I think slightly more than 10 years ago, all, all forms seemed to be blobs um, to some extent, and, and, and I wondered why. Um, if, if you at that time looked to Japan, or if you looked to Switzerland, all forms were slightly more rectangular or orthogonal. Um, but I thought, what could we, what kind of forms could we produce? I'll speak without this. What kind of forms could we produce if we were going to design um, without any references, without preconceptions, um, without, so say, a history of what we've seen and been, been taught? Um, what, what could we design if we could free ourselves from, from our education? Um, and very related to this is the question, how do we achieve the sort of newness? Um, the, my, the, the, the path I took in, in trying to achieve this was to, to look to nature. You've heard a lot about people looking to nature as, a, as an inspiration um, for design. Um, and I don't want to stretch this analogy, push this analogy too much, because there's also a lot, a lot of differences in terms of the process involved. But on a very basic level, if you look to nature, you have the cell division as, as a pro process of morphogenesis. And if you, if you try to abstract this process as much as possible and to bring it into the computer, um, you, you could do so by, by just looking at surfaces, by looking at a surface 
uh, up here in initial form, a rectangle and dividing it into two or four surfaces, dividing it again and again and again and again, much in the same way that a cell splits itself as it's growing. If you change the point where you divide the surface, if you just change the midpoint and, and run this um, several times, you can achieve already with a very, very simple rule an astounding variety of forms. Um, so, so I thought, why not, why not try to code this as an algorithm and bring it into the computer? We, we, it would make me much faster than, than trying to draw, draw these things. Um, we could create more details and, and ultimately produce more variants. And as architecture is three-dimensional, um, I wanted to work with volumes as opposed to um, simply in the two dimensions in the thing. The simplest volume is arguably a cube. And if we apply the same process that we just saw um, to the surfaces of a cube, so in other words, if we just divide these surfaces, um, then very quickly, after a few iterations, this cube will turn into something like this. We're just, we're just changing the ratios of where we're splitting the form. If you change them again, it will turn into something like this, or like this, or this. They're topologically, they're all, they're all cubes, actually. So one can begin to exert control over the form simply by, by going back and forth and, and tweaking the ratios of where one divides the, 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 for, the form. There's no other steps in the process. It's simply a division of the surfaces. Um, it's, it's essentially a folded cube. And if we apply different ratios along different positions of, of our shape, we can, we can begin to differentiate the form in three dimensions to create local conditions. We can, in a way, begin to sculpt the form um, and, and, yeah, on some level, yeah, sculpt it, exert control over it. We're, we're free of physical constraints. So unlike if we were doing this with paper, um, the paper can self-intersect, or at some point the paper is going to become stretched or become so small that it tears or something. It's because we're in the in the um, computational world, we can we can for once ignore all of these um, limitations, or we can add to them. We can we can say, why don't we simulate some property of paper? Why don't we um, why don't we say that if we fold something too much, it becomes porous or so? So in this case, for instance. Exactly that, that property has been simulated to introduce porosity. It, it's just a way of using using this, this the same process to create different um, conditions. And and by introducing these new these new possibilities, we we expand the scope of forms that that we can produce. And here you have just and I've added the rotation, essentially what's going on here, there's two folding ratios, um, which, which you see at the top, and then if, if you apply these over and over again, you see how the, the form changes as, as the ratios change. Um, but that's, the, I, I always say that's half the truth, because in reality, 99% of, of the folding ratios you apply will, will give you this, they'll, they'll give you an absolute noise, which the first time you see it might be interesting, but then after you, you play around with it and you see it for the 99th time, it gets to be um, very frustrating. The forms I showed before, they were the result of a lot of fine-tuning, of a lot of iterative trial and, and error. Um, be, because there's so, much, there's so many steps involved in the process, because one goes from the six surfaces of a cube to about two or three or four million, you you can't control the, the exact output before. You, only, you can only produce something, try to understand why, why it looks the way it does, tweak a variable, see how that affects the form, and so on. So it's, so it's a different way of designing um, the forms. But I wanted to, um, I, I found that in, in, in looking at these forms, I found that they were perhaps over-specified. Perhaps there's too much, um, tweaking going on, and, and I, I sought to, to detach myself from this a little bit more. Instead of at each step saying, let's change the ratios and design it in this way, I thought, why not, why not take myself out and try to create a process where the form um, responds to itself. So it responds to what happened before. So essentially, in a first step, the, the, uh, uh, 
rectangle is divided into four. And depending on how these four rectangles look, that's going to determine how in the next step they're divided. So essentially, one doesn't set many ratios anymore. But one simply, um, one simply sets up one single rule. So for instance, one can in a form like this. There's a lot of attributes here that may not be um, apparent to you, geometric attributes. You can, for instance, plot the length of the surfaces, because the form is made of very small surfaces and make the long ones black, the white ones um, white. Or you can plot the planarity of the surfaces, their curvature, how, how radial they are. Um, and you can use this information that's already contained in the form to determine what happens in the next step of the process. In doing so, you get, um, you, you get forms that where you only set up one rule that are arguably more um, organic looking than before. And because we're this is Zubinus. Oh, sorry, And because we're designing a process essentially, instead of designing an object, but we're designing the process of generates objects, we can run this this process again and again and again with slightly different rules to, to create variants, to create an entire family um, of forms. Um, but what I want to emphasize, it, it's, it's a very minimal process. It starts with a simple input, and all of these domes or cupolas that you just saw also started with a simple input, a, a cube, where half was just chopped off and you're looking at the inside of it. Um, and and it's, it's, in a way, it's a radically minimalist approach. All you're doing is you're just dividing the surfaces. Um, so it's a minimalist approach that, that creates a relatively, I don't know, perhaps exuberant um, articulation of the form. Um, I wanted to try to bring this, this process to architecture, to an architectural scale, and um, chose to design a column as, as, an, as an archetype um, of, of technological or aesthetic beliefs. Um, and I, was, I, was, I found columns appealing because if you, if you look at the classical orders, they were all designed according to, to sets of rules. And whether these were um, geometric proportions that were dictated or, or compositional rules of how to combine elements, um, it, it, essentially the, these columns are, are rule-based um, systems. Why? I'm, why not apply this rule-based system to see, see what it would produce? Um, and then what is also basically specifying the geometry, just at a, at a much, much smaller level. I started not with a cube, but with a cylinder, and I applied the same folding process we just saw. And after 10 iterations and then very many trials, um, there were the first series of columns here, which one can almost infinitely zoom into, depending upon how, how powerful your computer is. So it is essentially, the, the thing here is that you have, you have one single process that generates both the overall form, the general proportions and so on, and, and the surface detail. So you have one, one process that works at, at multiple levels, um, that works at multiple levels of the form. You could um, produce, formations that are basically at the, at the threshold of, of human visibility. So, so one is designing ultimately with, at, at the level of small, very small particles, and whether you see these particles as, as polygons or, or voxels, you, you can create, you have the potential to create something with a, a, a very, very high resolution that would not be drawable and perhaps not designable using conventional methods. I mean, it would take an architect probably months to draw in 2D or in 3D each, each surface detail, whether you're using a pen or a traditional AutoCAD program. Um, and, and what looks like a chicken or a skewer, <laughs> I always think to myself, are, are these forms, are they imaginable? I mean, to, to what extent, to what extent, I, I alluded to this earlier, to what extent 
do you already foresee what is happening, or do you only foresee it as you are, as you're beginning to work with the process? Um, I think it leads to, to slightly different role for the architect. So when one loses control over, I think, an exact geometry and assumes control over, over attributes, um, and one, one can use a different method to explore, to explore um, the, the possibility space. So one can work with very many variants in parallel. And then to go back to this analogy um, with, with nature, you can, you can work with different variants. And you can breed them, so to say. Um, you, you can let them have children. You can take aspects of the children, mix them together um, to spawn new generations, to spawn new permutations of form. And that's, that's what's happening here. It's basically all, all these two columns that you see in the foreground spawned all the ones that, that, are, that you see in the background. So the architect, in a way, is, is in the role of an orchestrator of these processes. I wanted to produce um, these forms, and uh, for a long time hesitated because I thought I wouldn't be able to get them out um, in a in a proper, um, to get that, basically I thought they wouldn't look anything the way they did um, as they did <coughs> in the computer. Um, this was three years ago when we started to build them, and at that point, you've heard much about Atec manufacturing, and it's, it's getting there, but at that point it was still um, not possible to 3D print something at such a high resolution. So we tried to slice it, we tried building it as a slice model. We um, began to slice the forms that you saw earlier. And we were very surprised when we saw this. There's essentially one slice in x-ray. Unbeknownst to us, there was a lot of stuff happening inside of the form that we were just inside the column that we were just never seeing. Because the programs that we were using to visualize it always showed it only from the outside. So these are x-rays or slices at different heights of the column. Essentially, we created an outline for a laser cutter, and this, in what was gruesome work, um, we <laughs> built this thing in slices, uh, 2,700 slices of one millimeter stacked on top of each other, hollowed out. Here it is. This is a photo of it. It's not a rendering. Um, <laughs> it looked quite similar to um, to what we had in the computer, so we were we were happy. Um, with it, all, almost all the details of the surfaces um, were, in a way, preserved. This is the inside, basically. This is the leftover of the uh, material that we put it out of. Um, so I'm just holding it, it's roughly 60 or 70 centimeters in diameter. I'm just holding a camera into it. Um, and here you can already see the limitations, one of the many limitations of such an approach. Um, at, at one point in the center of the material starts to tear. So yes, it was very labor intensive. There's the virtual side, 16 million facets. It takes 35 seconds to compute. Not to design, but, but to compute one single variant. And then there's the, the physical side, 2,700 layers, 700 kilos, enough surface area to cover the, the auditorium and, and, and uh, 200 hours of laser cutting. Fortunately, on multiple machines, so we reduced it a bit, but it was, um, it is problematic. We, um, uh, it's, it's not viable for anything, I think, bigger than something of this, of this scale. Um, this is at the Guangzhou Design Biennale, where we tried a similar approach, uh, this time not out of cardboard, but ABS plastic, um, using a much, much bigger machine, so And these columns have steel inside, so they are, um, as a column should be actually structural, they can, they can bear loads. And we used the, this, what I was showing earlier, that the design variants, to, to create, um, actually, each column is a hybrid of two, two different variants. Because if you go back and uh, look at something like this, um, there's only four columns here. It looks like more because we're playing with mirrors and the column is designed to look different in its reflection than, than it does in the front. So in retrospect, um, 
the columns have an order to them, um, but they're, they're also on, on the verge of, of chaos. It's, it's really the man-made versus the natural. Um, it's an order that's easy to distinguish from pure chaos, but nonetheless, the rules behind them are, are difficult to deduce by looking at them. But, um, they can't be explained through a, a reductionism. But the, the development that, that, that enabled them before I show the next project is basically we've, there was hand drawing on one hand, then there was in the 1960s the first computer application sketch pad, it was called um, essentially a gigantic computer that could draw a few polygons. Then you had AutoCAD, which essentially in the beginning was just a productivity enhancing tool rather than one that would allow you to explore new forms. You had the complex geometric tools of Maya, 3D Max, and Rhino, and now you have at your disposal um, procedures to work with. Um, just a simple process that you can you can encode. Um, we were quite naive in trying to um, expand this to a more immersive environment. Um, this was the the idea to create a sort of a cupola. Um, and a similar scheme here is a, um, an initial prototype of it. And we tried to build it up as a layered model also, and very quickly gave up. Um, because you're fighting against the material. When something isn't symmetric anymore, when it's suddenly dealing with shear forces, it needs to be glued. The, there were, the, the time it took was, was, um, was crazy. Um, and, and I think this is, this is typical in a way of a CNC manufacturing. So unless the, the fabrication constraints that you have are already somehow designed into the process, then you can't really take the output of a, um, of a computer program and, 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 and create it one-to-one. -one. Um, you, you need to model two processes, basically. One to, to design it and the other one to convert it to what, what the machine is to bring these other properties inside. We briefly considered subtractive manufacturing, milling, um, but this too, even with the five or six axis system, you have a lot of design constraints. There's a lot of the milling head can't get into certain um, small crevices and so on. So two major developments. I, I spoke about the computational one. I think in parallel, there has been the, the um, fabrication one. So from, from CNC fabrication, which was essentially this laser cutting, we're, we're now, you've probably heard much about it, um, at um, additive manufacturing. And um, revisiting again this, this attempt to create an immersive environment, to use these processes to create an immersive environment. Um, I received a commission together with a colleague of mine, Benjamin Dillenberger, to design a, a grotto. Um, and, and it brought it to me meant nothing. I, I literally have been only in one by King Ludwig, this, this who had built fairy tale castles in Germany. Um, but um, the, the project gradually grew on me because if you if you look at these grottoes, traditionally they, they somehow explore this dialectic between natural and man-made. It's a um, commission for a museum in France, and here was our initial um, concept of. One, um, one interior wall, one interior elevation. Um, there would be three or four of these, a space roughly 20 or 25 square meters big. Um, and we, I mean, production could no longer be, be an afterthought. So from the very beginning we thought, okay, if, if we go to the trouble of design, something like this, how, how, how can we get it out? Here it is how we initially imagined the surface detail. <coughs> And we look at different additive manufacturing technologies. We um, relatively quickly chose to build, to try to build this out of sand. And, and this is what you're, what you're looking at here. It's a, it's a printer that, that prints sand and that just glues particles together. Um, it is, it's very big. Um, it, it's, it can print a space, I think, in one volume that is, that is bigger than the hotel room I'm currently staying in. And um, so we, we, when we saw this machine, this gigantic machine, um, we, we became confident with a, a very large plan for our daughter. Here is 
basically it's a room that somebody can, can walk into. We haven't closed it at the top because we are a little bit scared that the structural aspects of the set have not been have not been tested um, in, in, in elevation. And how we, we are going to build it. So um, essentially building it out of gigantic components. Um, we could build it almost out of two single components. The problem though is, is not producing it, manufacturing it anymore. At that point the problem is actually transporting it. A piece would then weigh 13, 14 tons at which point it becomes difficult to, to, to bring it to a museum or put in an elevator and so on. So we, we have this out of manufacturing now and we, we're reaching, I think, an equivalency. We, I, I spoke earlier about these particles. We're reaching an equivalency between the particles that we have in the computer, whether surfaces or voxels, and, and coins of sand that we can print. It's, it's one to one. We, we don't lose very much information going from one to the other anymore. And we can, we can fabricate something without going to the process of adapting the design. Literally, if you, if you have it in the computer, you can save it as an STL file, press print, and, and, and the printer will, all goes well, um, print it. So what can you do? You can, you can have an unlimited differentiation within a single element, or between elements, just like with CNC fabrication. Um, but there's also, and this, this was really striking to us, there's no, there's no cost anymore for complexity. With this printer, it doesn't matter whether you print a, a box like this one, a, a completely plain box, um, whether hollow or solid, um, or you print the most elaborate form um, you can think of. The time that the printer takes is the same, and because you're paying by bounding box, the cost is identical also. Um, and, and this is, of course, radically different than anything in the past where ornament was usually something that uh, took um, countless artisans and, and, and very, very much um, time. We, we went back and we thought, okay, we can create any sort of topology. How do we even begin to design something like this? So we just started with very, very small elements, once again a cube, and, and assumed what, what happens if we can introduce porosity or multiple skins to it. And these are very, very early um, ideas simply about how, what happens if we're not dealing only with a single surface. Um, we gradually developed the form. These are studies, uh, form development studies that you see here. Um, my wife always says, don't show it in gold. No one is going to take you seriously. <laughs> things that would have been undrawable. Now we, we can't draw or even visualize what we've designed anymore. The, the file um, that, that we're creating is some 30 or 40 gigabytes and no, no drawing program can open it. It has half a billion um, <coughs> facets. And so, so we're only able to visualize a really rough approximation of, um, of what we can build. We can build stuff that we can't draw or visualize or, or display anymore. And as, as I said, there's going to be much more resolution than, than what you see here. It's just we, we can't get it out. Um, here is a, an initial um, 1 to 10 scale model of um, 3, 3D printed right now of the interior. Um, here is a, an actual component, but the, the real ones are not to get um, bigger. We're, we're working with structural engineers, and fortunately, the the, the sand, the pretty of sand, behaves very similar to sandstone. Um, so so you, you, you can use it structurally. You can make it hollow on the one hand, uh, up to like down to one or two centimeters, or you can have it completely, completely solid. And here is the um, printer. Uh, this is a piece as it comes out of the printer. <coughs> And the sand is basically the sand is you see the sand flowing out of it. So here's the printer going. 
going back and forth. It's basically a bed of sand, and there's gradually either there's glue applied to it, or there's no glue applied to it. It's, it's that simple. And it does layer by layer at a resolution of, I believe, 0.2 or 0.15 millimeters. This is how it comes out of the machine, and then the, the sand essentially gets vacuumed up. And this, this part is still, despite all the high techness of it, very, very, very manual job. You have to somehow clean it up and help the sound. Um, and this technology is changing, is changing very fast. This machine has only been around half a year. But um, there's other machines um, by an Israeli company that can already print multiple materials at once. So you can print um, not, not stone, but the plastic composites that are um, in some places um, see-through and in other places um, uh, opaque or something. Or you can print um, materials that are hard and soft and that have a complete gradation between, between the two. Um, there is, I, I think that in, in terms of the sound printing, the, there is still the question of structural performance, not in the short term, but in the long term. How is something, how is something like this um, withstand time? Uh, if you do the test now, it, it looks good, um, but, but nobody knows at this point how something like this is going to be happen. It's going to behave in five years from now. Um, there are material properties. How do you, how can you get a, a surface that isn't sand? How can you post process this? Um, right now, because it's sand, it's very porous, it absorbs a lot of water. It's not ideal for having outside. Um, there are, so there's questions regarding insulation, fire resistance, and so on. Um, but, then here, here you see another detail. Um, but, so, so the question is, does, to, or to me the question is, does this, this additive manufacturing um, represent a, a paradigm shift or, or, or is, it, is it just some, some sort of um, fashion that is going to have not, not very much implication um, in, in the long run of design? I, I'm not sure. Um, but you can, I mean, it's, it's amazing what, what has happened in, in the past couple of years. Um, if, if this technology is, does mature more, I, I, I think it could, it could be could be quite interesting. I think design is less likely to be justified by um, costs because there is no more cost to complexity. So there's no one that's going to say, no, if, if your design can't look like this, it's too expensive. Um, it's also less likely to, to be determined by, by constructability because essentially this machine can't bring any sort of form that, that we can conceive of. The geometries are within reach. So the, the fabrication constraints that were for a long time um, imposed by um, CNC uh, methods are, are, are gone. Um, if, if you look at the buildings you have in, um, the, that, that are around us, a lot of the buildings look the way they do because it's, that's simply the, the cheapest way of, of producing them. Um, and and this, these constraints are will arguably, or may arguably, um, disappear. So ornamental formal expression may or will not be a luxury anymore. Um, and, and whether we choose to pursue this, whether we choose to say um, we would like something ornamental, that, that's completely up to us. But there's no more, um, there's less likely to be um, this legitimization um, by saying, no, it's too expensive, no, you can't do it, no, it's unproducible. Um, we have where are we now? We have this, this new resolution um, at our fingertips. Um, we have less restrictions than ever before. We have more degrees of freedom. Um, it, I, to me, it's, it's the time to explore. It's, it's, we've, we've been given a new technology. Let, let's see what we can do with it. Let's see what is possible. I think some of these experiments that we've seen, um, they, they may, in, in 10 years' time or 20 years' time, seem naive. Um, I think on, on some level, others stand a chance of being being assimilated into into um, an, an architectural canon or, or a practice. Um, 
I would like to leave you with this quote. It's by Louis Kahn. Um, and Louis Kahn says, you say to a brick, what do you want, brick? The brick says to you, I like an arch. If you say to the brick, arches are expensive, and I can use a concrete window. You say to the brick, arches are expensive. I can use a concrete lintel of an opening. What do you think of that, brick? And the brick says, I like, or I want to be an arch. Um, the question we have today, perhaps, is what would a sound card like to be? Thank you. Lecture, the lecture tends to avoid the word ornament. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about form or shape that is created in some way, but I, I think I, it's I try to avoid the word beauty. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but one thing that always arose in my home university was when you talk about ornament, uh, modern architecture is usually shaped around uh, Adolf Law's no. statement that ornament is crime. So I, I want to know your views. Are you a criminal or are you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if you look at this golden image, I must be. You know, uh, yes, I must be a criminal. Um, <laughs> but he's no longer an investment banker. But I'm no longer an investment banker. <laughs> but I think um, I no, I definitely don't see ornament as crime. Um, I. <coughs> What, what at the same time I, I think interests me is, is um, a, a rule-based approach behind it. Um, not as a, as a, as a way of, of, of getting to a more safe stand on it, um, but, but I think it's an interesting contrast in terms of having a, a minimalism, a minimalist approach with a perhaps maximalist um, output. Um, and, and I think there, there's, a, so that's one, one part of it. I and I also think there's a time time and place um, for, for everything. I think you had, with um, mass production that, that came up through the Industrial um, Revolution, you, there, there, was a, there was a reason um, for not having, for having a reduced ornament. It was, it was simply about um, housing people, feeding people, raising people's living standards, and so on. Um, right now, we're, we're in a time where it seems like there is no cost anymore um, to creating, to creating whether you call it an ornament or 
just a higher degree of differentiation or um, just a higher diversification of forms. Um, I think all of this is, is within reach now. So, so that doesn't mean, um, so I think it, it doesn't imply that we have to do it, but I think there's, 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 there's less arguments against it, definitely. It becomes a choice, it becomes an option. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You said that this kind of column can be structured and it yes. compares some loads and the due to some other physical tests to, to test the structure, that how much load and compare and how it works. We, the, the, the structural part of it wasn't our um, primary goal in, in designing it. At the same time, for this exhibition, it had to carry a, a, a pediment on top of it. Um, so we um, basically we introduced steel in, in the middle of it. And you, you just essentially just have to model how, how strong and how strong the steel is. But it's not a, it wasn't a part of the design process, it was an afterthought, I so to say. For this grotto, um, yes, we have to we have to bring structural calculations into it because we have to control the degree of overhang mm -hmm. to make sure stuff doesn't um, uh, break off, and we have to um, control the points where these bricks are so to say stacked on top of each other. So it, it does come into the design process. It's a, it's a hybridized process. You have this folding on the one hand, and you have the feedback to the whole structure. I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. I, when I spoke to a professor at our, our university about, about this project, he became very angry because he found it completely antisocial. He said, if, if, if this succeeds or if you promote this, all, all artisans have the chance of going bankrupt and, and so on. And he refused to in any way become associated with this. Um, I, I don't see it. In so, such black and white terms, I believe there's a. I mean, obviously you have you have a limitation to the material. Obviously, that's that's completely different than somebody working with with, with some wood. Um, there's different design processes behind it, which um, not necessarily one is a substitute for for the other. I think that the two can exist very well alongside each other, and um, they, I I, I think, um, or exist together or influence each other. So I, I don't see it as a, a, a threat to um, in, in the way that this professor does um, at all. Um, quite the contrary, I think you can, you can get you can very much inspired. I, I do get very much inspiration from these traditional processes, and would be delighted if, if that would at some point become a two-way inspiration. Um, can you give us about the uh, your aesthetic criteria? Because um, throughout, your, uh, throughout the uh, numbers of iterations, uh, you somehow like, choose one like model to actually 3D print. So what kind of like, you know, um, element or I mean like a, a property of the geometry? That's that's the key question. Um, that's the, the the question I, I, I ask myself all the time, especially in terms of. Um, in terms of this initial desire to move away from working with, with references at the same time, you, of course you can't get them, get them out of your system. Um, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. Is, is, it, is it newness? Is it interestingness? Is it the, this, the, the cry, criminal word of beauty? I, I'm not sure. Um, at, at one point I tried to get the computer to not only produce these forms, but to evaluate them. Um, so that then it could begin to optimize them and I could go to sleep and it would come up, come up with something. But it's as, as easy as it may be to use the computer to generate something, to evaluate it, it's, it's, nearly, it's nearly impossible. You can, you can get it to um, recognize noise, like this one slide I showed, but, but beyond that, I, I've, had, I've had no success. So it's, it's, I think it's very, the answer is very similar to, to uh, traditional design. 
um, project. In, in this case, there are very few functional requirements. Um, so you can't use that as a justification. You, you just have to use compositional, compositional uh, principles, what, what you find appealing or interesting or um, Noise issue you had, and sometimes you have quite a sense of mathematical background. But there's many of us here that are starting to do some programming, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering, like, how much of the development of this, especially in like early stages, was a trial and error, a tinkering, or did you rely heavily on a mathematical kind of foundation for it's developing an algorithm? Or it's, um, it's how to yeah how to recognize kind of this right. or obtain kind of desired form for some noise. Um, that is well that's a, that's a trial that's a trial and error to, uh, uh, just assessing and going back iteratively and, and changing the form slowly because the forms are they're deterministic there's no randomness involved but they're not entirely predictable so you kind of have just a, a back and forth. In terms of developing the process, it's, it's based on this subdivision process, as it's um, called, is based on um, one that you find in animation. So whether it's Shrek or any other 3D animated film, essentially there's a very coarse model that, that came to the cube that I showed at the foundation of it. And then um, through subdivision, you get these, you get these curvatures and so on. So usually a coarse model just becomes round, and this is like an established um, scheme that was developed by the head of Pixar. Um, and if you change the weights, as, as I do them, you get forms that have non-rounded attributes. You get forms that are, you know, uh, either spiky or, or have holes and that kind of stuff. Other questions? No. Maybe then. If, just yes. One question for me. Oh. Um, you know, like this is. Third time or fourth time you know, you, you see uh, that I see your lecture, and then today I felt you know uh, like you know, your research is coming really to the level that actual uh, fabrication method or like a development of robotics even mm -hmm. you know seems like a very critical element you know, in your yeah. research it seems to be, and then just because of these days you know, we have. Um, also possibility to be on the side of developing the robotic itself or like you know, the nozzle itself uh, right. to you know, you know, inject you know, those kind of sands and you know, the uh, adhesives. And uh, how do you see uh, like you know, possibility to be involved in that and then like you know, to, I don't know, like even develop this just new uh, machine chemistry system you know, to do you know, these kind of uh, constructions or like, you know, it's not a pure computation where I started to do that. It involves a lot of effort and a lot of the time also. And then I was wondering you know, how you see the management of, I don't know, time or research you know, to be involved in this, this kind of you know, process also. I'm, I'm not involved in the fabrication side at all. So I don't develop these, uh, these printers or I don't develop the, uh, the, the, the nozzles or there are a lot of people that do. There's open source 3D printers um, available. You can download basically the plans to print out the parts using CNC manufacturing. So order a few components and you can build your own and, and manipulate it. Um, we're, we're working, of course, closely with, with the company um, that prints us because they've never handled such an amount of data. So, there, so there's a back and, back and forth, but I'm not, I'm not a, an engineer. I'm not a, a scientist. But you're, let's say, from your side, you're asking in you know, a certain capability of you know, machines to be developed you know, into specific directions. Like, because you want to do this, I want you know, this nozzle to be a little bit more like this. Or you know, in the opposite way, um, your design you know, gets actually brought you know, into next level because of the you know, uh, constraint of you know, the machines. It's, it's it's both. Um, it's, we have our wishes, of course, and, 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 and yes, we, 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 we go there and say, can you do this, can you use a different sort of glue that will allow us to, to make pieces more structured or thinner, and, and so on. So there is a, a back and forth um, there. 
there isn't at this point so much adaptation of the form anymore to the capabilities of the machine because the machine can, can just do a, a lot, it seems, it seems already, I mean, in terms of the resolution. The, the biggest problem we have right now is the surface coding. And, and that's also something where we try to push the company to help us develop something to create different surface attributes rather than the pure coarse black um, sound. Um, no one said a couple of words, uh, but I'm sure most of us thought about them. The aesthetics might be unreferenced, but you know it's Baroque and Rococo, and it's there, and it's very strong. Yep. So I wanted to know what you feel about it, because I think it's, if alien bugs like Baroque, they would do that. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Why does it look like that? You get, I, I get uh, I get baroque. I get underwater creatures. Alligator comes up a lot. Um, Rococo, yeah, of course, comes up also. Why, do, why does it look like that? I think um, there. So, first of all, I'm not sure that underwater creature is necessarily baroque. But um, why does it look like that? I think each of these forms that, that we've seen have a that that you mentioned. Um, have a very high degree of resolution, um, more so than uh, a modern disability. I think that the idea to work, to, the, to design reference-free, it's, it's, it's something that one tries to strive for to come up with something new. It's tremendously difficult. Of course you're affected by, by, by what you know. So one, uh, this goes back to the question that he asked um, about how you evaluate it, why, why you choose what you choose. Um, is it, is it Baroque because I spent part of my time in, in the Bavarian church? I, I, I don't know. Um, so it's, I think it's, it's, despite the desire to break out of this reference uh, mindset, it's very difficult to do so. Um, I think at the same time, these are examples where you have a start, but you have a very, very high specificity and resolution. And I think one of the reasons why the, the maybe more Baroque is because it's usually it's symmetrical. And that's not something that it doesn't have to be because the machine, it's not cheaper to print the same on yes. both sides. So that's a kind of a, is that a subjective decision to make it symmetrical or is that kind of just the result of the, the process? I mean, it's an interesting point because none of the forms are actually symmetrical. Oh. <laughs> they are all slightly off um, because otherwise, Yes. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. so if you look at this one, or, or even if you look at the, 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 the columns, they're all, all slightly upside But yes, it is, a, it is a decision, as much as it is to make it symmetrical, to, to bring them slightly upside. Thank you. I think uh, if you're working with a program in using the script to design something, when you stop the script, it's very difficult. Yes. Um, and I won't deny you know, the variation um, to stop your design, um, or stop the script to design the, the form. Is that something to stop mean? developing the script, you mean? Or to no, stop, stop the stop the actual script. No. Ah, just to stop the actual program right. from running. For example, if you continue yeah. um, to the same process over and over again, this one will be different. Yes. Okay. But you stop uh, this. Yeah, it's it's the same it's the same question I think that, that was asked um, over there. It's there are no there are very few functional um, rationales that you can use to, to say I want to stop it here or there. If you're dealing with something that is in essence um, ornamental, such as the bottle, um, so so yes, you can say okay at this point it's going to collapse or the weight becomes too heavy and so on. But ultimately, it's, it's you have to have to subjectively decide what you find interesting or beautiful or what you're pursuing for them. Any other questions? Uh, now, uh, for me, it's extremely, tremendously interesting the shop we're working with. We're working on, uh, particularly in the past, I would say five years, maybe you said three years ago, but in the past five years, uh, prior to that, architectural uh, digital exploration was primarily in the 2D and digital 
screening it once. And about the five years ago, people tried to figure out how to actually get it out of the computer uh, to test it out. So you see a range of uh, experiments. So you cannot quite uh, judge based on, you know, even though there aren't any questions about this issue, you know, what do you do with these type of things other than calm? Uh, but uh, there is uh, still the stage uh, in order to really get the project out of the computer. And what are the ways in which the different methodology of constructing it? Uh, but the choice of uh, the printing technology that you have emerged, but there are a range of the data projects we have uh, seen uh, by the Archimedes uh, from Germany, a slightly different approaches. But, uh, but I think the objective is somewhat similar, I mean, we have extended our uh, investigation within 2D media and what are the ways to explore the 3D and with material uh, constraints. So I think that some of the questions are, uh, yes, there's a decision-making criteria based on aesthetics, but at the same time, how do you actually get it out of 2D environment? And it seems a kind of mundane question, but uh, that's actually very difficult. And some of the project, uh, it's not constructible. And the people are kind of pursuing making all these things with specific scale, with specific material properties, and they do to fail. Whereas I think you have done it quite well to translate a kind of 2D environment into actual dimensional. But the question is, uh, for me at least, uh, your primary objective of this 90 degree world to broad, a blobby world, and you have created this uh, kind of fractal world uh, that neither uh, in that category, but where do you go from there? Are you, are you, are you succeeded in uh, kind of answering the question that motivated you to get into this business or this mode of research? Uh, but how do you actually extend that? But at the right. same time, as I said, there's a range of people who are doing it, a similar trajectory. And I, I found it fascinating to see the range of their project that we develop and there's every day or every time we see their project, you know, something new mm -hmm. and they work. It's, to answer it, I, where do I see it going? I think it's, it's, a, it's a continuous exploration. I think we, 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 we live in a time where there's new technologies on the computational side, on the fabrication side. They're changing tremendously fast. Um, and it's just up to us, as, as architects historically, when, when steel was introduced, or when in, in the 60s plastic were introduced, we just have to see what, what is possible, what new freedoms do we have, um, what can we do, what can it be good for. I, I, don't, think, I don't think the questions are, are answered yet. Yeah. But there's a kind of playful uh, that in some extent we are immersing us. I don't definitely. mean you kind of play for the kind no, of definitely. natural way, but see the possibility uh, yeah. without kind of setting the particular objective. Yeah. But there's a moment that you might see some light on the horizon that you begin to target certain things. So. A light on, well, what is the light on the horizon? Because as much as, much as your financial background led you to do this, Maybe the ultimate goal isn't necessarily architectural. Perhaps yeah. Yeah. could be some other uh, application that may give you these kind of more you know, more successful output. To me, the goal is architectural. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you believe it or not, it is. It is. And, um, and that probably is the light at the end of the tunnel. To, to try to move it, um, to try to see how how can these processes, or similar processes, but in general, how can these new technologies be applied um, at, at an architectural scale? What what kind of uh, spatial impressions? What kind of structures? What kind of buildings will, would we find ourselves in? Um, and that doesn't have to mean we're going to be inside um, uh, these golden grottos or something. Um, I think this is this is one what you're seeing one single person using this technology in a single way. I'm sure if you use the same technology, it would look completely different. If you use the same one, it would look completely different. So I think that goes back to the questions that uh, were posed here. I think there is no, the, the process itself, at least this technology, um, 
permits such degrees of freedom that there is no certain aesthetic um, or, or beauty ideal or, or such um, associated with it. I think we can use it to, to produce whatever, whatever it is that we'd like. I think there's attributes that are become possible, like this super high resolution, this, this non-repetition, um, this um, differentiation within a form. I mean, if we, if we imagine, just, just as one example to, uh, of it being used completely differently, if we imagine the, the, the beam up there, um, it has a constant diameter, but of course the loads that are acting on it aren't, aren't, const, aren't constant. Why is it nonetheless, um, why is it nonetheless um, such, a, such a constant component? Of course, because it's mass produced, it would be more expensive to, to produce it um, so that it reflects their actual load distribution. Um, with this additive manufacturing, once these these, these um, sand printed things are structural, there's there's of course no more reason for this um, structural homogeneity. So that apart from um, this 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 ornamental example, you can see could could see this um, technology work on a completely different level or scale. Great, thank you.